Hello, Big Ten football fans, and welcome back into another episode of the Big Ten Blitz presented by the Floor Slap. I'm your host, Sean, and we have a really packed episode ahead of ourselves today. First, going to get into the Ohio State offensive coordinator reshuffle, Bill O'Brien out, Chip Kelly in, so going to break down what that means for Ohio State and UCLA moving forward. Then we're going to get into some Big Ten football program tier rankings. So 1 through 18, power ranking every single Big Ten football program and putting them into tiers, really assessing the state of that football program and how ready they are to play winning football over the next three to five years. And then finally, we'll get into some spring storylines. This is going to be the first of three parts where we go team by team and tell you the biggest thing that you need to be looking for in your team's spring practice, whether you're looking at spring reports or watching the spring game. Every team has at least one thing that is really going to dictate how successful their 2024 season is. So I have a lot to go through today. Won't waste any more time. Going to jump right into it. All right, so to kick things off today, Going to go with the biggest news out of the Big Ten of the past week or so, and that is Bill O'Brien left the Ohio State offensive coordinator position to go be the head coach at BC. So what does Ohio State do? They somehow upgrade that offensive coordinator position by bringing in former UCLA head coach Chip Kelly. And I said, you know, when we broke down this Bill O'Brien hire on our previous episode, um, said that the only offensive coordinator hire that they could have reasonably made that I would have liked better than Bill O'Brien was Chip Kelly. So um, in short for Ohio State, I think this is an absolute win for them. Don't make any mistake. Bill O'Brien is a great offensive coordinator. I mean, he's done great things at Penn State, at Alabama, with the Houston Texans. But Bill O'Brien's specialty is developing quarterbacks and a potent passing attack. And even with Ryan Day no longer calling plays anymore, this is still his offense and his playbook. And he is still going to be heavily involved in the development of Ohio State's quarterbacks this year and for years to come. And even though last year was ugly on the offensive side of the football, especially Kyle McCord's play, what mattered most against Michigan, I I think that Ryan Day did get the most he could have out of Kyle McCord. And I think moving forward, as long as Ryan Day is there, you can count on Ohio State having high-level quarterback play. And even though Bill O'Brien would have done a lot for that quarterback room, I don't believe that Ohio State really needed someone to come in and rework all of these quarterbacks. But Chip Kelly, on the other hand, his arrival addresses a major need for this Ohio State offense. Because the fact of the matter is, for the Buckeyes, the ground game has faltered the past couple seasons. And Michigan's been able to beat Ohio State three straight times, largely because they've just dominated them on the ground every single game. And I feel like Ryan Day, especially these past couple seasons, has really struggled to find a rhythm on the ground game as a play caller. Whenever he runs the balls, a lot of the time, it does feel kind of predictable, and it feels like the defense knows when that run is coming. And Chip Kelly's greatest strengths as an offensive mind, whether it's at the college level or the NFL level, um, and his strengths as a play caller too, are his run concepts. He's great at utilizing the quarterback run, And don't make no mistake, Will Howard is a very mobile guy, much more mobile than uh, C.J. Stroud or Kyle McCord that we've seen at Ohio State the past couple seasons. And being able to utilize the quarterback's legs in RPOs, in counters, in triple options, in play action. And he's able to run all of those different kinds of plays out of the same look. And the first, you know, second and a half of those plays all look the same to the defense, whether you're running a triple option or a play action deep shot. And so that's what makes Chip Kelly so great. As an offensive play caller, he's able to keep defenses off schedule, and you combine a running attack like that with the you know, passing attack of Ryan Day and Brian Hartline and what we've seen out of Ohio State traditionally over these past five years. I mean, that, to me, is an unstoppable offense. And if you don't think that Ohio State really needed an upgrade like this in the run game, just look at the numbers. And you know, if you're watching on YouTube now, you can see the chart uh, that really illustrates just how much better UCLA has been at running the ball than Ohio State. Better rushing total, rushing yardage total, and better yards per carry um, each of the past three years for the most part. And even you go back to Oregon when Chip Kelly was there from 2009 to 2012, each of those years, Oregon was top five in the country in rushing yards per game and in yards per carry. 
So you got to figure at least a little of that will translate over to Ohio State. And you take a team who averaged 4.2 yards per carry last year. That was 80th in the country. And I think you give him someone like Chip Kelly who can really help develop this run game and make this a really versatile attack. I think, I mean, this offense is already loaded with talent and you combine Ryan Day and Chip Kelly in that same offense. It's, it's getting scary for Big Ten defenses. I'll, I'll tell you that. The Ohio State offense is looking as promising as ever with this hire. But that's only part of the story here, what Chip Kelly means for Ohio State. On the other side with UCLA, I'm really curious what's going on inside UCLA that made Chip Kelly want out this badly because he's been sniffing around for other jobs for a month, a little bit longer at this point. It's been evident uh, for a while that Chip Kelly wanted to get out of UCLA. And it wasn't like he was really on the hot seat either. I think UCLA would have been happy to bring Chip Kelly back, but Chip Kelly wanted to get out. And maybe he was trying to carve a path to the NFL. He was talking to the Seahawks about that offensive coordinator role. Um, but I mean, he's leave. it's just almost unfathomable to, to think that he is leaving a secure job at a big 10 school to go be a coordinator at another big 10 school. Never mind where UCLA and Ohio state are on the pecking order of that conference. It's not like he's leaving in Indiana. Who's won only three games over the past three, I mean, nine games over the past three seasons. Chip Kelly has had success at UCLA. He took over a team that had back-to-back -back losing seasons and has gone 25 and 13 over the past three seasons. And that's been, you know, pretty successful for UCLA if you look at the, how they've performed over the past 20 years or so. And I think Chip Kelly wanting out of UCLA this badly, it's, I think, probably a sign that UCLA either, or Chip Kelly did not believe that UCLA was willing or able to make the investment into the program that he wanted. Because, I mean, you have to remember, they lost Dante Moore, that five-star quarterback, to go be the backup at Oregon. They brought in only 10 guys in the 2024 recruiting class, and they're off to a really slow start already in 2025. So um, that, might have part, that might be part of it with Chip Kelly. He just didn't feel that UCLA was in a position to go be a college football playoff contender. And maybe it could even go deeper than that. Maybe there could be a rift between him and the coaches or the players or the administration. Um, maybe he just didn't want to coach a 7-8-9 win team and being left out of the college football playoff. Head coach or not, maybe he wanted to get back to being a part of a truly winning football team that can go compete for championships. Um, but there, whatever it is, there's definitely more to this than we aren't hearing because, like I said before, it, this is not a lateral move going from head coach of UCLA to offensive coordinator of Ohio State. I don't care who you are or how great of a program Ohio State is. Um, you know, being a coordinator does not trump being the head football coach of a power conference team and for the school of the size of UCLA on a resume. So now this begs the question, what happens with UCLA? Because coming into the Big Ten, you figure they had maybe a top five coach in the country in the conference with Chip Kelly, that they'd at least be in a position to, you know, compete for bowl games and, you know, be a, maybe a top 25 team. But now the program just seems like it's in disarray. I mean, I already mentioned how, you know, their their falters on the recruiting trail and losing Dante Moore. Now they lose their head coach and they turn to Deshaun Foster as their next head coach. And he's a UCLA guy. He played running back for them from 98 to 2001, amassed over 3000 yards with them. He had a six year NFL career, but he just started coaching in 2013 and he's only ever been a grad assistant or a running backs coach uh, in his decade or so of coaching experience. and. You know, Deshaun Foster hasn't even run an entire offense himself. He hasn't been the sole play caller um, at any of his stops. And, you know, he does have experience under Jim Mora in his first stint with UCLA. And he coached under uh, Cliff Kingsbury at Texas Tech for a few years before returning to coach under um, Chip Kelly at UCLA. But it just doesn't seem to me that he has the resume to go off and be a successful power, I mean, Big Ten football coach. I guess it is a good sign that the Raiders had, you know, hired him to be their running back coach. That's the job that he left to go take on this head coaching role. But it just seems like a massive jump to go from running back coach to head coach of a program like UCLA. And um, I get that Chip Kelly definitely left them in a really tough position, taking another job two weeks into February when pretty much every, all the other coaching staffs in the country um, have been solidified. And there definitely was not as deep of a candidate pool to choose from had Chip Kelly 
announced its decision two months prior. But um, it's definitely, I think, a little bit concerning if you're a UCLA head coach. I mean, the good news is that, you know, the athletic director of UCLA has you know, cited Deshaun Foster's, you know, his integrity, his energy, and his passion. And I think those are all things that can win at the college level. But, and, you know, to an extent, you definitely need, you know, this kind of firm belief in your next head coach if you want them to have uh, success, if you want this turnaround to end up, you know, being successful. But this is still a first time head coach with no NFL coaching experience and no experience calling plays, an unproven track record on the recruiting trail, and no championships of any sort as a player or as a coach to, to, to put his name to. I understand UCLA was in a tough position with Chip Kelly leaving when he did, but this hire does not make me feel confident that they are heading in the right direction as a program. Um, because they are now, I mean, they went from having a relatively optimistic outlook for entering the Big Ten under Chip Kelly to now entering a full rebuild in a completely new conference with a more difficult schedule. Uh, it's going to be more difficult to recruit in the Big Ten than it was in the Pac-12 now. And it just sets UCLA, UCLA, I'm sorry, UCLA up in a really tough position uh, heading into their first year in the Big Ten. So this move, Chip Kelly leaving UCLA to go be Ohio State's offensive coordinator, could not be more positive for the Buckeyes and their chances of winning the 2024 National Championship. And it could not be more devastating for UCLA and their hopes of contending in the Big Ten and at least being uh, a decent bowl team. So, I mean, this move put, takes two programs, put them in complete opposite trajectory. And it'll be really interesting to see how this unfolds, how Ryan Day and Chip Kelly work together as, you know, offensive minds on the same staff. And it'll be really interesting to see how Deshaun Foster handles his first um, head coaching job. So a lot more to come out of that. But my first impression, a little bit dicey for UCLA. But moving on from that, I'm going to jump into our next segment now. Big 10 program tiers. So, and we'll show, we'll, you know, show these tiers on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, but I broke up the 18 Big Ten football programs into six tiers. And to kick things off, we have obviously the cream of the crop, the top teams in the Big Ten, the college football playoff favorites. And, and these are teams whose fan bases can really expect a college football playoff appearance every season over the, these next five years. And that's kind of the window that I'm judging these teams by. You know, keep in mind, these power rankings are not just for the 2024 season. It's really this, it's the state of the program and how capable they are of winning, playing winning football over the next three to five years. So first and foremost, obviously, Ohio State and Oregon are definitely at the top of the Big Ten. If you wanted, you can even separate them from Michigan and Penn State and make your own little tier at the very top of national championship favorites, because I think... Under Dan Lanning and Ryan Day, I think Ohio State will continue to be perennial national championship contenders um, over the next three to five years, at the very least. Uh, but, you know, we're, we can't break these tiers up uh, too much. So I'm going to keep Penn State and Michigan in that same tier with them as the college football playoff favorites. As far as Michigan goes, you know, I've talked the last couple episodes about my concern for where they stand as a program with Jim Harbaugh out leaving. Sharon Moore, not totally confident that they can, that he can keep Michigan at the level that Jim Harbaugh had them at. And those are all very valid. I said in my last episode, in fact, if I'm ranking the top 10 programs in the country over the next five to 10 years, that Michigan's not in there. That doesn't mean that they aren't a top 15 program moving forward. And that doesn't mean that the fan base should have realistic expectations of getting to the playoff. Because the fact of the matter is that they are the defending national champions is that they do have one of the better rosters returning in college football next year. They're going to have a great defense, and they should continue to have a great offensive line under Sharon Moore. And, you know, there can certainly be a scenario where, you know, when we do these tier rankings next year or the year after, I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan dips a tier or two, but they're the defending national champions. Uh, they are keeping, you know, a key guy in Sharon Moore as their head coach, and they have definitely you know, deserve to be in this top tier until they prove otherwise on the football field. You know, they're still one of the biggest brains in all of college football. They are a true blue bud of the sport. And like I said, they deserve to be in this top tier of the Big Ten until they prove otherwise on the field. And then Penn State. I can imagine some people might have a problem with Penn State being in the same tier as programs like Ohio State, Michigan, and Oregon. And, you know, there are valid knocks that you can say on James Franklin and this Penn State program over their performance for the past 
you know, eight years or so. You can point to his record against Ohio State and Michigan since 2016. You can point to how the offense has taken a step back in successive years. And you can point to the fact that James Franklin has really struggled to win the big game, um, really ever since that 2016 upset win against Ohio State. All those things are very valid. But the fact of the matter, the hump that, Ohio, that Penn State has failed to get over the past few years is now a lot smaller than um, it has been under the 14 playoff with you know us expanding to 12 teams now. And the fact of the matter is that Penn State would have made a 12-team playoff in six of the past eight years under James Franklin. And they have had top three recruiting classes in the conference and top 15 uh, recruiting classes nationally in each of the past three years. And that is including um, the, the new Big Ten members coming over, USC, Washington, UCLA, and Oregon in those rankings. And they're bringing in two new coordinators this season in Andy Kotelnicki from, uh, from Kansas and Tom Allen from Indiana. I've talked about them before. They are both slam dunk hires, and I think both of those guys will help elevate both sides of those fo- uh, both sides of those balls. Pause. Um, but you know, it's it's hard to envision Penn State winning a national championship over the next five years. It's it's very valid, you know, given how they've performed um, under James Franklin. But Penn State fans have every right to expect a playoff out of this team. The way the roster is constructed, they are as talented as anyone in the country. James Franklin has been as consistent of a head coach as anyone in the conference. So uh, Penn State absolutely deserves to be in this top tier, the college football playoff favorites in the Big Ten. Moving on to tier number two, these are the college football playoff contenders. So these are, you know, eight, nine, maybe 10 win teams, top 25 caliber teams who, you know, you are not going to expect to make the playoff every single year but they can sneak into that upper echelon of college football every few years when things align. And first on this list, we have Wisconsin. And I know they're coming off of a bad year, seven and six in Luke Fickle's first season. But in hindsight, I think the expectations for Wisconsin in 2023 were just too high. I mean, because the fact of the matter is they were not a good football team in 2022. Paul Christ had not been recruiting well, even up to Wisconsin standards for his last few years with the school. They couldn't contend at all in the transfer portal. They weren't developing players that they could get, you know, like you're used to seeing Wisconsin do. And they just have, had not been the same Wisconsin team in Paul Christ's last couple years. And they had a lot to fix on both sides of the ball. And it was unfair to think Luke Fickle, Phil Longo, and Mike Tressel could turn it all around in one season. That being said, I still believe that Luke Fickle um, is the right person for this job, and I believe in how he is running Wisconsin, and I think that he can get Wisconsin back to where they want to be, which is a top 15 program in the country, um, in the college football playoff um, conversation every year, and I firmly believe in Luke Fickle. Because remember, when he went to Cincinnati, he went 4-8 and his first season with Cincinnati before bringing back-to-back 11-plus win seasons. Uh, for the Bearcats. So it's, you know, turning around a program is, it's hard to do in one season. So it might not even happen this year. They have a really tough schedule and they need a, I think they need a longer term solution at quarterback instead of going with another one year rental again in Tyler Van Dyke. But I think Wisconsin will get back to being a top 20, 15 team in no time under Luke Fickle. If it's not this year, it'll happen in 2025. And I expect um, Wisconsin to be a part of the college football playoff picture on an annual basis, not too far from now. Number six, and the second team in this second tier, is Iowa. And this is a, a program I think I had a little bit of a tough time pinpointing exactly where they should be because I think they're kind of teetering here. And I think Iowa could easily tum- tumble if this Tim Lester hire as offensive coordinator flops. And, you know, I illustrated my concern for this hire in our last episode, how just of all the candidates that they could have brought in, they bring a guy who is, really does not have a great track record of developing great offenses. And then, you know, if Kirk Ferentz uh, decides that he can't keep up with the changes in college football and he walks away from the game, which is something I predicted might happen in our last episode as well, you know, if those two things happen, Iowa could easily tumble two or three tiers, um, you, know, you know, given how competitive and hard it is to win in college football today. But, you know, you also have to remember that a lot of Iowa's success over the past 10 years or so came from playing in the Big Ten West, which has consistently been one of, if not the worst division in all of college football. 
and Iowa is not going to be able to hide behind easy conference games anymore. They are playing the best of the best in the Big Ten year in, year out, and they're going to have to put up or shut up and prove that the success that they've had in the Big Ten West was no fluke. But having Iowa this high up really has to do with their track record more than anything and the faith I have in their defense. I mean, Iowa, you can, I can talk all day along how, about how concerned I am for their offense. Their defense is still going to be great next year, and it will be good enough to keep them in almost every single game that they play, no matter how much their offense struggles. And, you know, the track record under Kirk Ferentz speaks for, themsel- speaks for itself. I mean, I don't think Kirk Ferentz is going to plummet this program into being a five or six win team. The fact of the matter is Iowa has 11 straight winning seasons. They have finished in the past 24 of the past five years. They have four 10 plus win seasons in the past 10 years. And like I said, defense never fails to reload. I think that should be good enough to mask some of their offensive struggles that seem imminent. So who knows? Would I be shocked if Iowa drops a tier or two if we, when we do these at the same time next year? No, not at all. But he, Iowa's consistency on the defensive side of the ball and the fact that Kirk Ferentz just simply wins and does really nothing else at Iowa, uh, they, the, the stability of Kirk Ferentz at Iowa certainly, I think, keeps them secure in this second tier entering 2024. And then the last team in this second tier is going to be USC, a program I think a lot of people are kind of selling short right now. I know it's easy to be sour on them given how this past season went, given Lincoln Riley's history of, or lack thereof, of pl- uh, college football playoff success. And considering how much of a flop Caleb Williams Heisman defense was, it's easy to kind of be sour on USC as a program right now. But you also can't forget, this is USC. This is one of the biggest blue bloods in all of college football. And Lincoln Riley finally made a serious investment on the defensive side of the ball with DeAnton Lynn bringing him over from UCLA. I mean, he's a guy, he has a decade of NFL coaching experience, and he turned UCLA's defense around from one of the worst in all of college football in 2022 to a top 15 unit last year. He did that in one season. And so I think if you give Lincoln Riley that kind of defense, who knows what USC can accomplish? And... You know, you, you saw what Miller Moss did. They're a you know, presumptive next quarterback filling in for Caleb Williams. He had a six-touchdown performance in the Holiday Bowl, and I think that was a great reminder, too, that you know, just because Caleb Williams is leaving, just because they're losing a good amount of offensive skill position players, doesn't mean that Lincoln Riley does not know how to reload an offense. So I think it's a little unfair to think that USC is going to be a middling team, you know, a six-seven win team in the Big Ten. I mean, they got speed. They are bringing, they've been bringing in talent, and now you add in at least an average defense to a Lincoln Riley offense, I think that could be really dangerous. And you also, you know, I think this hire of DeAnton Lynn as defensive coordinator for USC reminds me a lot of Ryan Day going out and hiring Jim Knowles as his defensive coordinator. I mean, defense faltered for Ohio State for a few years. It was their Achilles Achilles heel. It was the main reason they couldn't win a national championship or even a Big Ten championship with guys like Justin Fields and CJ Stroud as their quarterback. So Ryan Day went out and he found a great defensive coordinator to just completely own that side of the ball. He made the investment he needed to, and it's paying off. Ohio State is entering 2024 with probably the best defense in the country. So I think this hire of Deanne Lynn is very similar to that. It might not, he might not be able to turn USC around um, in just one season, but it gives, I think, that side of the ball an identity that they have lacked for a really long time. USC, it's been a long time since UCLA had that great defense that you kind of think of when you think of the Pete Carroll USC era. They always had great defenses, and it's been a really long time since USC has. I think just DeAnton Lynn hire will get USC where they need to be. And like I said, you give a Lincoln Riley offense, even an average defense, they could make some noise. And if DeAnton Lynn can make this USC defense elite, there's no reason USC can't bump up into the top tier of the Big Ten. And moving into tier number three, I'm going to call this tier Exciting Rebuilds. It's two teams that are breaking in new coaching staffs and have a long ways to go to become a legitimate contender, but I think they have the resources and momentum to get there soon enough. Uh, First off is Washington, and I know that they are in a really tough position. I talked about it in one of our last episodes just you know, they're going to be starting so many first and second year guys that they're replacing 20 starters from a team that played for a national championship. Now they have to bring in a whole new coaching staff. 
2024 is shaping up for a tough year for the Huskies, but that doesn't mean that I like their overall outlook over these next five years. Because I love the Jed, Jed Fish hire from Arizona. I think Jed Fish had Arizona ready to pull off what Washington did last season in 2024. If he had stuck around, they had a really young team who was clicking late in the season. It looks like they were going to return close to 20 starters. Um, obviously, they've lost some with the transfer portal, but Jed Fish was cooking something nice at Arizona. Now he gets to go do the same thing at Washington. And most importantly, with Washington, the program is fully invested. I mean, they have the facilities, the NIL money, traction on the recruiting trail, the fan base, and really just the overall energy to keep this thing going. And like I said, it's an uphill battle. They have to replace 20 starters, going to have a lot of first and second year guys that will be forced to start. And, you know, Jed Fish needs some time to bring in his own guys into this program. So it's definitely a bad time to be going through a massive change like this when you're going into a conference like the Big Ten. And so even though you, Washington's outlook for 2024 might be a five or six win team, I really like the direction they're heading in. And I think Jed Fish will get Washington back to where Kalen DeBauer had them. And the other team in this list is Nebraska. Um, you know, Matt Rule has turned programs around before, and I think he's going to do it again at Nebraska. He's probably a year or two away from really breaking through and hitting 9, 10 wins and starting to appear in uh, the AP Top 25. But I think he has everything you need out of a head football coach to, to build a winning program uh, at a place like Nebraska. And same situation as Washington. This Nebraska football program is fully invested. They are bought in and ready to do whatever it takes to become a national force again. So I think the outlook for both of these teams, I think if either of these teams were to go eight and four next year, it would be a massive win and I think would exceed a lot of expectations. But regardless, the stability is there for both of these teams. They have their head coach. They have administrations that are willing to invest in these programs. And there's both of these teams, no matter how the 2024 season goes, both of these teams have plenty of optimism um, going into the future. And then our fourth tier, this is an interesting one. I'm going to call this tier better than you think because it has a couple teams that you probably would assume are bottom feeders in the Big Ten. And these are two teams that are not on the same level as the other nine programs we just went through. I don't see the college football playoff attainable in the near future for these programs. But at the same time, I don't think they bought, belong in those bottom couple tiers in the Big Ten. I think both of these guys also have their head coaches of the future, and I think both of them have positive trajectories, and I think will be winning football teams over the next five years. The first one is Rutgers. And believe it or not, outside of the quarterback position, which obviously is the most important position in football, but outside of the quarterback position, Rutgers has a top 25 roster in college football next year. I think that's just a fact. I think they're going to have a great defense, much improved offensive line, some good skill position players. And uh, obviously, they have to figure out that quarterback position, and it's probably not going to happen in 2024. But Rutgers doesn't need a really elite quarterback to be a six, seven, eight win team on an annual basis. I think so. I think getting that quarterback that they need is certainly attainable. Greg Schiano has been recruiting a lot better, and he's been starting to keep that New Jersey talent in state, which is huge for Rutgers becoming a perennial winning football team. Because New Jersey and Pennsylvania, which is right next to New Jersey, are really underrated states as far as high school talent. I mean, they're probably fifth and sixth best states in the country behind Texas, Florida, California, Georgia, and Ohio. I think those are the clear top five. And then New Jersey and Pennsylvania are right there. So if Greg Schiano can keep up this trend and keep that talent in state and in the area. Uh, I mean, the ceiling for Rutgers could be really exciting. And the defense has gone from 56th to 38th to 16th nationally in total defense over the past three seasons. Um, like I said, elevating skill positions with the return of Kyle Manungai, adding in transfer wide receiver uh, Demir Miller, who had over 2,100 yards over the past couple seasons, and Antonio White, who was a top 300 recruit in this past recruiting class. So, I mean, there's definitely talent coming into this program more and more every single year. Greg Schiano has built a winner at Rutgers before. He has the university finally willing to invest in this program and upgrade the, you know, the facilities and the coaching staff and you know, willing to invest a little bit in NIL as well. So Rutgers is easily in the best position that they have been since they've joined the Big Ten. And I think they're you know, 
they had they surprised a lot of people by getting to seven wins this season. And I don't think that was a fluke. I think we're going to see more seasons like that and more season seasons that are even better than that moving forward out of Greg Schiano and Rutgers. And the other team on this list is Purdue. And Purdue certainly did not have the first year that they expected under new head coach Ryan Walters. They went four and eight. Defense struggled to adapt to Walters' 3-4 scheme that he brought over from Illinois. And they lose a lot of production, especially in the, or at the skill position players, um, heading into next year. So, you know, they you know, might be up for another you know, struggling season next year as well. They may only win four, five, six games. That doesn't mean that I don't completely believe in Ryan Walters. I think that he is the right guy for Purdue, and he has his br- program in an upward trajectory. And they had a top 25 recruiting class this past season, and they're off to a really good start in the 2025 class. And what I love to see out of Purdue is even though they were out of bowl eligibility before they even got to November, you never saw quit out of this football team. They brought it every single Saturday. And that's more than you can say for a lot of teams who had first year head coaches uh, whose season didn't necessarily go as planned. I mean, just look at Wisconsin. They had a few games where it was tough to watch. It was evident that they were just not bringing their best effort. And you never saw that out of Purdue. He is a player's coach. Guys love him. He is, you know, high energy, and he, he's winning on the recruiting field. He's bringing in good transfer classes. He has Hudson Card, um, who's was a four-star prospect. He had an up and down season at quarterback last year, but he's probably around for another two seasons as well. So the infrastructure is there, and Purdue, their their schedule is really really tough this season. So, like I said, they may only be winning four, five, six games, but. Their outlook over the next five years, I think Ryan Walters will get them back into bowl eligibility, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see Purdue kind of peek into the top 25 on a couple occasions over these next five years. They've proven they've been capable of doing that under previous head coaches over the past 20 years, and I just really like Ryan Walters, and I firmly believe that he can help get Purdue where they ultimately want to go, and you know that's you know being a top 25 team. I think they have that capability. And our fifth tier, we're kind of edging towards the really bottom of the barrel here in the Big Ten. This tier is just called stagnant. I mean, these are teams who, you know, can probably should expect a bowl appearance every single season. They have veteran coaching staffs in place. They have some level of stability. And but it just kind of feels like the programs have plateaued. There isn't much momentum going on in any of these programs. And I feel like all of these programs are entering pivotal 2024 seasons uh, as far as, you know, how, how hot the, the seat is for their coaching staffs. And first on this tier, 12th overall now, is Minnesota under P.J. Fleck. They're coming off a 6-7 and seven season in which they only snuck into a bowl game because uh, there weren't enough 6-6 six and six teams in college football. So they had to pluck 5-7 and seven Minnesota out to go into a bowl game. You know, the good news for them is they have a lot of guys returning next year. A lot of guys that I don't think even Minnesota fans expected to return. You know, guys like cornerback Justin Wally, wide receiver Daniel Jackson. Both are starting offensive tackles. Running back Darius Taylor, who's probably the most slept on running back in all of college football. So there are pieces there to have a successful 2024 and I guess make Minnesota fans a little less soured on P.J. Fleck. But the reality of the situation for Minnesota is that P.J. Fleck has consistently been bringing in recruiting classes that are in the bottom half of the conference. The defense has taken a step back in three consecutive seasons after being one of college football's best. They couldn't stop a nosebleed this past year. And P.J. Fleck has been really vocal about how Minnesota is at the bottom of the barrel in all of college football for NIL. Not just in the Big Ten. They cannot compete with even some mid-major schools as far as NIL go, if what P.J. Fleck has been saying has been accurate. And it just feels to me like uh, the lure and the kind of the shimmer of P.J. Fleck has kind of faded. And I think he may have already peaked as head coach for Minnesota. And that's a peak that culminated in zero Big Ten championship appearances. Even when, you know, he was, believe it or not, only a few years ago, Minnesota was in the college football playoff top 10. And even so, it just feels like It just doesn't feel like P.J. Fleck's success has really materialized into anything tangible for Minnesota uh, in his time there. And it makes me think that, you know, Minnesota was never able to win the Big Ten West. 
a division that, like I said before, has, was consistently one of, if not the worst divisions in all of college football, at least in the power conferences. Minnesota was never able to win the Big Ten West. Now the competition is fiercer. They don't have a lot of put positive momentum. The roster is not as talented as it used to be. So how can I expect anything more than what we saw last year from Minnesota? And I'm sure a lot of Gopher fans would agree with me that you know, P.J. Fleck is starting to wear on them a little bit. And I think 2024 is very pivotal for where P.J. Fleck stands uh, with these Minnesota fans. I wouldn't be shocked at all if we're sitting here next year talking about a new Minnesota football coach. Next on this tier is Maryland. And honestly, I mean, they, like, like I said with Rutgers, I mean, Maryland is in better position now than they ever have been since they joined the Big Ten. They've gone to three straight bowl games for the first time since 2006 to 2008. And like I said, Minis I mean, Mike Loxley has Maryland firmly as relevant as they ever have been in the Big Ten. But this is not about, you know, these rankings is not about what you can expect. What I mean, what programs have done. It's about what you can expect them to do in the future. And I feel like 2023 was Maryland's money year. I feel like if they were ever to rise above that group of, you know, marginal bowl teams, you know, five, six, seven win teams, depending on how things shake out in any given season, if they were to ever rise above that pack of teams, sniff the top 25 and make some noise on the national stage, last year was it. And they went seven and five and they picked up a bowl game against a just pitiful Auburn team who they should have destroyed like they did. And it just, you know, it was a nice season for Maryland, but I feel like it fell short of expectations. And now we enter a 2024 season for Maryland where they have to break in a first year starting quarterback. They lose, like, once again, a lot of skill position players and recruiting has fallen off under Mike Loxley. You know, he was bringing in you know, marginal top 25 classes. Now he's consistently outside the top 40 in recruiting classes. And I just feel like there isn't a whole lot of energy in this program. I mean, all the times I tuned in to watch Minnesota, I mean, sorry, Maryland play last year, I mean, they were playing in front of a half empty stadium, whether they were hosting Penn State or Michigan, or they were hosting Virginia in a primetime winnable matchup. No matter what the scenario was, stadium was always half empty, and they've been plagued by poor play along the line of scrimmage for years. And, you know, they've brought in transfers on both sides of the football that really just have not panned out. And, now the pulse of this offense, Talia Tonga Viola, is gone. And like I said, bringing in a first-year starting quarterback, it's just like, I, I have a hard time seeing how Maryland can match last year's success. And that is the case moving forward beyond 2024 as well. And I just feel like if Maryland couldn't get over the hump these past two seasons, I have a really hard time seeing them doing it now in a more competitive conference, in a more competitive landscape for bringing in talent to your football team. It just seems like it's in a tough position for Mike Loxley in Maryland. And, you know, that's not to say if he, they go 5-7 and seven next year that he, Mike Loxley deserves to get fired. It's just, you know, I had high hopes for Mike Loxley heading into last year and the way last season panned out, I think kind of shows the true colors of Maryland football. And I don't think that they are really built to get to that next level to you know, sniff the top 25 or let alone the college football playoff. So, I mean, Maryland is definitely stagnant. It's a program right now. And last on this tier is Illinois. And I think the loss of defensive coordinator Ryan Walters, who obviously went to Purdue, weighed a lot more heavily on this team than I thought. Obviously, I mean, Illinois lost a boatload of talent from the 2022 team, like Tommy DeVito, Chase Brown, Sidney Brown, Devin Witherspoon. All of those guys had wildly successful uh, rookie seasons in the NFL, at least compared to what they were expected to do. But even with all that talent on the team in 2022, they still only went eight and five. And I think what we saw out of Illinois last year really could not stop anyone. I mean, they went from a top 10 defense in college football to legitimately one of the worst defenses in the entire country in just one season without Ryan Walters. And I think that's kind of more in line with what we can expect out of Illinois moving forward. Because, I mean, the, you know, tip out of a Brett Bielema coached football team, I think you tend to expect great offensive line play and great defense. And Illinois did not have close to either of that last season. So 
And Illinois, as it is, is a really difficult school to attract talent to. Brett Bielema is getting older. I don't think his best years as a head coach are ahead of him. Um, even so, Brett Bielema still has Illinois in a better position than they have been in over the past 10, 15 years. And that's worth something. I think a lot of Illinois fans can reasonably expect a bowl appearance this season. And I don't think Illinois is going to drop to you know winning two or three games a year like they were for a long stretch before Brett Bielema got there. But I also just don't see Illinois kind of punching through that ceiling a little bit. I don't expect them to be any better than a six, maybe seven win team moving forward. So that's why I definitely have Illinois as a stagnant program right now. And then getting into our, our fifth tier, uh, or I'm sorry, our sixth tier. These are the, the bottom teams in the Big Ten um, as we project over for these next three to five years. These are all rebuilding teams. These are all programs that are rebuilding from scratch. The college football playoff is not even in the discussion for their five-year outlook. And really what they're concerned with is just ensuring that they have the right coach and infrastructure in place to become winning football teams again. And the top team in this bottom tier, and we're, out, we're now on team number 15, is Northwestern. No doubt in my mind that head coach David Braun is the guy there. What he did last year, I think should have gotten him national coach of the year because no one did more with less. No one picked that Northwestern to win more than two, uh, two games and they ended up winning eight. It was just a really great season from him. But at the same time, David Braun and Northwestern did benefit from that Big Ten West schedule and they won essentially every 50-50 game that they were in last year. And that trend doesn't usually span over multiple seasons. Usually if you win a lot of close games one season, you kind of lose those close games the following season. That's just a trend that we've seen in college football for a really long time. Northwestern also had a lot of experience in that defense and at quarterback and on the offensive line. A lot of that experience is gone now. So I think this Northwestern team that he's dealing with in 2024, not as talented as last year. So you know, even though I love David Braun, you can't ignore what he was able to do last season. It doesn't change who Northwestern is as a program. The academic standards that they have and the financial investment that this program has makes it very difficult to win there. And I think David Braun can still, you know, I think he still has to prove that he can bring in the right guys, that he can get talent into Northwestern and then develop them. Um, because just because he had one good season does not mean I can expect eight win seasons out of Northwestern moving forward. I think this is an ongoing process for David Brown and Northwestern in order to keep this a winning football program. And, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how Northwestern navigates this whole um, NIL um, era that we are in. And next behind Northwestern, I have Michigan State. And let's get one thing clear. What they have... Um, you know, Jonathan Smith coming in from Oregon State to be their next head coach. He's not walking into the same situation that Mel Tucker did when he took over as head coach because Mark D'Antonio, you know, left Michigan State in pretty good condition. There's a reason that Michigan State was able to be, you know, a top 15 team in 2021. But Michigan State now looks a lot different than it did three or five years ago. Michigan State is really depleted of talent in virtually every single position group. and you know, I think what Jonathan Smith has to do here at Michigan State is a true start from scratch situation. That being said, I do love the hire. And I do think that, you know, he was able to build Oregon State into a winner because Oregon State was in a very similar situation when he took over there. He was able to build Oregon State into a winner. He should be able to do, do the same thing with Michigan State. But we also can't let Mark D'Antonio's success cloud our perception of Michigan State as a program because there is a reason that Michigan refers to them as their little brother historically that is very true before Mark D'Antonio was hired in 2007 Michigan State didn't have back-to-back -back winning seasons since the 1980s and you know historically this is a program that takes a firm back seat to Ohio State Michigan and Penn State what we saw out of them in the 2010s under Mark D'Antonio was not normal so I just had to you know, get that out there. Michigan State is certainly capable of returning to the national stage and maybe even competing for the college football playoff under Jonathan Smith. I love him as a hire, but let's not forget that this is, you know, we're not building a program like Michigan up from scratch here. We're building Michigan State, and it's definitely harder to, to build that team into a winning program than it is a program like Michigan. 
Then 17th, uh, third in this bottom tier is UCLA. I already covered it a little bit earlier with Chip Kelly leaving. And I think with UCLA, it's kind of similar to Maryland. It felt like 2023 was UCLA, UCLA's money year. And they did go 8-5. and five. It wasn't a bad year, but they really stumbled down the stretch. And now, like I mentioned before, they lose Dante Moore, who was supposed to be their future. Uh, Chip Kelly is gone. They have the worst 2024 recruiting class in the Big Ten with just 10 commitments, only one so far in 2025. And I think the school is probably more interested in building up their basketball program than their football program right now. So I'm sure the football program is going to take a backseat in terms of financial investment. And, you know, the future of UCLA right now just seems like a giant unknown. And, you know, their new head coach certainly has a tall task under him. And I think, you know, UCLA is firmly at the bottom of the Big Ten right now, heading into 2024. But not at the very bottom, because the eight, my bottom ranked football program, at least at this point in time, is the Indiana Hoosiers. And part of me, it was part of me kind of hurt putting them this low because I really love the hire of Kurt Signetti. I mentioned him on our first episode that, you know, he's done nothing but win no matter where he where he's gone and a program like Indiana getting a proven coach like Kurt Signetti, I think is as good of a win as he could have possibly hoped for. But it doesn't change that Indiana is the most difficult power conference school to build a winning program at. You know, they're a basketball program through and through. That's one thing. And Indiana is not a very rich state as far as high school talent. And the few great prospects that Indiana does produce on an annual basis always get plucked up by either Ohio State or Notre Dame. And, you know, they're taking a backseat to great talent in their own state. And, you know, they do have Ohio right next to them. But then, you know, it's Indiana competing with Cincinnati and Michigan State for that kind of talent. So, and excluding the COVID season with Indiana, you have to go all the way back to 1993 to 1994 uh, to find the last time that Indiana had a winning football season. And they've never in their entire program history have had a 10-win season. So history is really fighting against Indiana. I would love to, I, I would love to see Kurt Signetti succeed. And I think, like I said, he is the best possible hire Indiana could have made in this hiring cycle. But it's just such a massive undertaking. Until I see some results on the field, it's impossible for me not to leave Indiana at the bottom of this list. Now, of these four teams in the bottom tier, of these four rebuilding teams, if there's one team that I think can have a successful rebuild and become a top 25 team in the next five years and maybe even make a college football playoff, it's definitely Michigan State. And a lot of that has to do with their recent, th- I mean, their track record of it. Um, you know, in the, in the college football playoff era, they have four finishes inside the top 25. Northwestern, surprisingly, also has four, but UCLA and Indiana have only combined for three. So I think of all these coaches too, of all these new coaches that are stepping into these rebuilding programs, Jonathan Smith is the only head coach who has been a head coach at a power uh, school from the power conferences. He's the only one who's coached a team that's made the college football playoff top 25. So out of these four teams, Michigan State definitely has the best chances of becoming a you know top 25 team again. And I think they also, of all these four schools, I think the Michigan State program is most willing to make the kind of investment they need to get to that level. But that's it. Those are our tiered rankings, one through 18, and would love to do this every single year as you kind of, um, you know, move throughout college football. And there should be a lot of changes, you know, after this season, but I feel like that's a pretty, we have a pretty firm grasp at where all these schools really stand right now. And that'll take us into our third and final segment in this episode of the Big Ten Blitz. We're going to get into some spring storylines. So this is part one of three. So um, over the next month or so, going to take six teams and tell you exactly what you need to be looking for throughout spring practice as you're going through articles, watching videos of practice and, you know, watching the spring game. I think every team has at least this one thing that is going to really determine how successful their 2024 season will be or, or won't be. And to kick things off, we're going to start with Iowa. And the thing I am watching more so than anything, I mean, this is kind of a broad answer. It's their offense because my eyes are solely on the new offensive coordinator, Tim Lester. 
Because listen, the fact of the matter is their defense will be great again. I mean, Jay Higgins and Nick Jackson return at linebacker, and they combined for almost 300 tackles last year. Uh, Jamari Harris and Sebastian Castro, one of the best cornerback safety duos in all of college football. And they also have safety uh, Xavier Nwankpa. It's a mouthful to say, but he he is a former five-star prospect, and he's primed to break out in the back end of that defense. I was still kind of searching for that defensive end to step up with Joe Evans gone, but there's no reason to think that this Iowa defense won't be top five in the Big Ten and top 15 nationally at the very least next year. And then you turn to the offense, and at least on paper, this offense should make tremendous strides next season. And they've, they returned their three-man backfield of LaShawn Williams, Caleb Johnson, and Jazian Peterson. Caleb Brown at wide receiver comes back. He was that Ohio State transfer top 100 prospect in 2022. Um, he had a really strong finish to 2023. And so he should build off of that and become you know, a very capable receiver, leading receiver for Iowa. And they also return a, a formidable duo at tight end in Luke Lachey and Addison Estrenga. Ostrenga was a freshman last year, but got really thrust into the spotlight with injuries uh, to Eric All and Luke Lachey. And he played really well. And so now Lachey and Ostrenga return. They have two studs at tight end, and they return everyone on the offensive line. And Cade McNamara comes back at quarterback, and he's going to be 100% healthy. So on paper, this offense should be a lot better. But if there's one thing that I've learned covering Iowa over the past couple of seasons, is that, you know, it almost doesn't matter who they have on the roster. It's all about coaching because guess what? On paper, Iowa's offense should have gotten better last year compared to 2022, but somehow it got worse. So really, the success of this offense and ultimately the success of this Iowa football team uh, entirely comes down to Tim Lester, you know, and what he's able to do with this offense. And fortunately, in his introductory press conference, when Kirk Ferentz was talking about him, it didn't seem like Tim Lester was going to have a lot of free, free reign to rework this offense and put something new together. So it's going to be really interesting throughout the spring to see if there's signs of some sort of change in scheme or philosophy. It'll be interesting to see if he can get something out of a wide receiver room that has been depleted of talent for years. It's going to be really interesting to see if Tim Lester can help, you know, Cade McNamara develop into something more than just an average starting quarterback at the college level. So, you know, what direction this offense goes will determine how successful Iowa really is next year with a much more difficult schedule than they're used to. And how successful this offense is, is going to let lie entirely on Tim Lester's shoulders. So throughout this spring for Iowa, I'm really just looking for any sort of innovation on the offensive side of the ball any kind of sign that they are going to be running something a little bit more than just 50 halfback counters and halfback dives every single game, um, that'd be a nice kind of a nice indication of progress for that side of the football. And the next team we're going to talk about for spring sport storylines, Wisconsin. And I'm really keying in on this running back room heading into the spring. Because I don't have too much worries outside of that running back room. Because I think this defense is going to have another year to adapt to that 3-3-5 defense. They return linebacker Jake Chaney, uh, cornerback Ricardo Hallman, and safety Hunter Wohler. All three of those guys are one of the best at their position in all of the Big Ten. They do have some question marks around their defensive line because they return only one guy who had more than a sack last year. And really, that defensive line got pushed around all year. Big reason why that defense struggled. And so that defensive line definitely needs to take a step forward if Wisconsin wants to get back to having a great defense. But overall, I think we can expect this defense to improve in 2024 and at least start to take the shape of a defense you'd expect out of a Luke Fickle team. So that shifts my focus then to the offensive side of the football. Um, You know, they return... Uh, their top wide receivers in Skylar Bell and Bryson Green. They're going with another one-year rental at quarterback with Tyler Van Dyke out of Miami. And I feel like I can, I kind of know who he is already. I feel like I'm not, you know, really keying in on him during spring practice to see what he's made of because I know who Tyler Van Dyke is. He has the prototypical size and arm strength you want out of your quarterback. 
He's not overly mobile, but he is tough to bring down. And, you know, he's going to make as many boneheaded decisions or errant throws as he will really impressive NFL caliber throws in any given game. I mean, there's a reason he couldn't hold off freshman quarterback Emory Williams for the starting job at Miami. I think Tyler Van Dyke is essentially a Cade McNamara, but with better physical tools and a little bit more inconsistency. So I know what to expect out of Tyler Van Dyke. I think the success of this Wisconsin offense will depend entirely on how much is is asked out of Tyler Van Dyke. Because if he's only asked to make one or two big plays a game, mainly just manage the game, and if he can be afforded a mistake or two, I think Wisconsin will be just fine. But if he needs to throw the ball 35 plus times a game, and if he's expected to push the ball downfield a lot to be that sole source of big plays on offense, Wisconsin's going to be in a lot of trouble. So how much is asked out of Tyler Van Dyke is going to depend entirely on this running game. And so they lose Braylon Allen, obviously, one of the best running backs in the NFL draft this upcoming season, and they replace him with a four-man committee of Chesma Lucy, Jackson Acker, and Cade Yacomelli. Those are three returning guys, and they brought in Tawe Walker from Oklahoma, who had a nice season in his first year getting you know real touches. He had about 600 scrimmage yards for Oklahoma last year. So they have these four guys. They're going to run some sort of committee, but I'm really curious if any of these running backs are capable of generating big plays. Because it's one thing, especially behind an offensive line like Wisconsin's, to be able to run the ball for consistently positive yardage. It's one thing to be able to run the ball for two, three, four, five yards every time you touch the ball. But are these running backs capable of generating big plays? You know, are they able to catch be be legitimate threats catching the ball out of the backfield? Because let's not forget, Praylon Allen caught 28 balls last year. and so. I know Chesma Lucy is capable of ripping off some big runs, but he also has not been able to stay healthy over the past three years. So he is not a bell cow running back by any, any stretch of the imagination. And then these other three running backs they have are largely unproven guys. So if I'm a Wisconsin fan, I'm really keeping my eye on this backfield this spring. I want to see if at least one of these guys can show signs of being a dynamic playmaker Um, The playmaker that Wisconsin really needs on this offense to make sure that not too much is put on Tyler Van Dyke's shoulders. But if we get through the spring and there's no indication that these guys have that it factor, that these guys can really break off any big runs or be the source of big plays, then I'm going to start worrying about Wisconsin. Um, So definitely keeping my eye on the running back room for Wisconsin. And third, we're going to stay with another former Big Ten West member, Nebraska. And this one's really easy for me. All my eyes are on Dylan Rayola. Um, Because honestly, there's not too much else on this roster that really concerns me. I think the defensive turnaround we saw from Nebraska last year was incredible and really not normal. Because I've talked a little bit about how Purdue and Wisconsin really struggled to adapt to uh, new defenses in their first years last year. And that's kind of the norm. It's to be expected. You know, if you have a massive scheme change on the defensive side of the football, you know, it's expected to take a season or two to really adapt. That was not the case for Nebraska, which is a testament to what Matt Rule is building there. They went from one of the worst defenses in all of college football in 2022 to a really respectable defense, one that was certainly in the top half of the Big Ten last year and would have been more highly regarded had the offense not been such a nightmare. Um, But really, for the most part, in Matt Rule's first season, every single position group improved, and I expect that trend to continue. And I expect Nebraska to be a much better football team in 2024. But the one position group that did not improve in Matt Rule's first year was the quarterback play. It was abysmal again. And Nebraska got a huge win with Dylan Rayola. He's the number one prospect in the 2024 class. They flipped him from Georgia. He's already enrolled at Nebraska. He's on campus. He's going to be there for the spring. And he's going to be immediately competing for that starting job. So... You know, I'm talking about Nebraska, you know, how much faith I have in them. They certainly have their question marks last year. They lack a lockdown cornerback and their running back production wasn't great last year. And it feels like all of their eggs are in this Dante Dowdle basket, who's that transfer running back from Oregon. But all in all, I like the direction this team is heading in. I think the sole determining factor in whether or not uh, Nebraska will be, you know, struggling to get to a bowl game again, or if they can hit seven, eight, nine wins it's going to play it's going to be firmly on the quarterback. And that quarterback battle right now is looking like Dylan Rayola versus Heinrich Harburg. And we saw plenty of Harburg last year 
I've seen enough to know that he is not the guy for Nebraska if they want to win more than five games. So it's really easy to hone in on Dylan Rayola. And, you know, you have to understand that he is a true freshman quarterback. He's 18 years old. You can't expect too much out of him. You cannot expect him to come in and put up prolific numbers in his first season as a starter. You know, you have to understand that he will go through his fair share of growing pains in his first season as a starter. But Dylan Rayola does have the arm talent he needs to be a successful college quarterback right now. He has some game-changing ability. So throughout the spring, if he can show some signs of maturity and composure in the pocket and good decision-making, Nebraska could have a really good season. But you know, if we watch the spring and it becomes apparent early that he's going to have a rough first season, if he's plagued with freshman mistakes and forcing the ball and holding onto the ball too long and ultimately can't be trusted to start those first few games in September, you know, there's a really good chance that this season is going to go just like last year. So it's really risky to have this much riding on a true freshman quarterback, but when he's as talented as Dylan Rayola is, you certainly have a chance. And so I think Dylan Rayola, this 18-year-old quarterback, holds the key for whether Nebraska will be 5-7 and seven or maybe even 8-4 and four next year. They have a wide, a wide range of outcomes and it all is on Dylan Rayola's shoulders, so I'm keeping my eye on him. Fourth, we're going to shift our focus to one of the new members, Oregon. And I've talked a lot about Oregon these past couple episodes and how stacked they're going to be in 2024. Um, you know, at every single position group, they either are returning key starters or they are bringing in top level transfers, except maybe along the defensive line. And that's kind of my one concern for Oregon moving forward because they lose defensive end Brandon Dorless, who's been a three-year starter, and they also lose their top three nose tackles. And I love Jordan Birch but um, at defensive end, but I really love him more so because of his size and vers versatility, being able to eat up blocks and be able to line up on different points of the line of scrimmage. But also, he's not a proven elite pass rusher. He had only three sacks last year. Um, but Oregon did bring in some great prospects in this in this recruiting class, and they also have a bundle of edge rushers from the 2023 class. They have a bunch of guys that were top 200 prospects in that class. Mateo Uyunglele, Blake Purchase, Tatum Tuioti. Uh, those three guys are all guys who could have big second seasons, and I think will have to step up if Oregon wants to have a great offense defensive line. They also have Jamari Caldwell. He had six and a half sacks for Houston last year. He projects more so as a nose tackle, but he could be counted on to play a big pass rushing role given the inexperience elsewhere. So those four guys and Jordan Birch are all guys that I'm keeping my eye, my eye on in the spring because the fact of the matter for Oregon is no matter how talented the back end of your defense is, and make no mistake, Oregon has one of the most talented you know, back sevens in um, the entire country. But if you need to bring extra defenders in order to get pressure on the quarterback, your defense is exploitable. And that's just a fact. Because if you are only rushing three or four guys and your, the opposing quarterback has four or five, six seconds to throw in a clean pocket, I don't care how talented the back end of your defense is. A good quarterback, you know, a quarterback they would play in the college football playoff will find the weakness. And if you have to bring in a fifth or a sixth guy to rush the quarterback, I don't care if you can get after the quarterback in a couple of seconds, there is a gap somewhere on the field and a great offensive line will allow a great quarterback to find that hole. And that's the kind of stuff that Oregon will face in the college football playoff. So I think regardless of how this defensive line develops, Oregon can expect to win 10 or 11 games and get to the playoff. But whether or not they are a true national championship contender will depend on some pass rushers emerging on this defensive line. So that's what I'm keeping an eye on for the Ducks. And fifth, I'm going to check out the Maryland Terrapins. And what I'm looking for them for um, in the spring is really just their entire play along the line of scrimmage. Because I mentioned it before, Maryland has been plagued by poor play along the offensive and defensive line for years. They've had to find workarounds for getting thoroughly dominated on both sides of the line of scrimmage for most of Mike Loxley's time with the program, which honestly makes his success the past three seasons really impressive considering that they've never had, I mean, they've barely had an average offensive or defensive line. 
So last year, I mean, they had a massive overhaul on the offensive line via the portal. They, you know, got a completely new room, essentially, and that did not work out at all. They were shuffling as many as 13 guys on the offensive line last year. They never found a concrete starting five. This year, they returned four guys who played a good amount, but, you know, never became one of those solidified every week starters. And they bring in three more transfers. So I really don't, do not know what to expect there. And then on the defensive line, the good news is virtually everyone returns there. Headlined by defensive end Quishon Fuller. He's a potential all Big Ten defensive end. And they have a really deep interior defensive line led by Ty Z Johnson. But Maryland did not bring in any new faces, at least so far, via the transfer portal or the 2024 recruiting class to really elevate that competition in that room. So barring some additions in the spring transfer portal, Maryland's really just relying on these guys coming back to just develop and get better. And at the college level, we love to assume that, you know, these college players will get better year over year over year, but that's just not always the case. And sometimes having a room the same as the year before isn't always a good thing. So Maryland loses a lot on both sides of the ball next year. And like I've said a couple of times, we'll be breaking in a first year starting quarterback. And if they want any chance of keeping this bull appearance streak going, they're going to need some veterans to step up on the offensive and defensive line and deliver much better play. So for Maryland this spring, I am looking nowhere but the line of scrimmage. I'm looking for any sort of indication that this offensive and defensive line can elevate their play and at least become like a league average unit across the Big Ten. And finally, the sixth and final spring storyline, I'm going to look at Illinois and Champaign under Brett Bielema. And for Illinois, my eyes are falling squarely on their quarterback, Luke Altmaier, because on paper, it, it's looking like Illinois is going to have a tough time in 2024. Outside of wide receiver Pat Bryant, I'm not sure where any explosiveness can really come from on offense. They have to replace both longtime starting offensive tackles and their defense loses its best players in Johnny Newton and Keith Randolph and has a big depth issue at pretty much every single level. So if they get hit with injuries, they could be in a world of hurt. And their schedule features Kansas, Nebraska, Penn State, Michigan, and Oregon. Three of those five games on the road, all before November. So they really dive right into a really difficult schedule. So on paper, it really is looking like Illinois is going to struggle to get to a bowl game this year. But if there's one thing this spring that can change my mind on where I see Illinois heading into next season, it's some growth out of Luke Altmaier. I was a huge defender of his last year. He played behind an offensive line that forced him to bail out of the pocket right after the snap way too many times. He never really had a clean pocket to throw into. And, you know, he just didn't have anyone else step up on this offense to replace Chase Brown in the backfield and really relieve some of the stress from that passing game. It really felt like Luke Altmaier had to do it all himself. And yes, he had some really good receivers to throw the ball to, but he had no running game and no offensive line to, to lean on. I think he's really talented. I think he's really an underrated dual threat. He has some really good wheels. And when he has time to step the ball, to step up in the pocket and really plant and deliver a good throw, he can throw the ball into some really tight windows. And so, I mean, he certainly has potential. And I think Luke Altmaier um, has a bright future ahead of him. But, you know, from what I saw last year, he just isn't the quality of quarterback that they need to elevate this whole offense and mask all the holes they have on both sides of the ball. But. If he can show some maturity, if he can start to kind of put it all together, and if he can start to, you know, be able to deliver accurate balls while getting hit, you know, 10 times a game, which is likely what he's staring at in 2024, if Luke Altmaier can just become an overall more complete quarterback, show some maturity, and really show a command of this offense, you know, Illinois could surprise some people. I think Luke Altmaier has enough talent to take what should be a four or five win team and turn them into a six, seven win team. So that's what I'm looking at for Illinois in the spring is just the development and maturity of Luke Altmaier. Can he become the quarterback that Illinois needs him to be in order to get to a bowl game? And that'll do it for our spring storylines. And that'll also do it for episode three of the Big Ten Blitz. As always, I've been your host, Sean. Really appreciate you hanging in there with me. 
And now that football season is officially over, the Super Bowl is in the rearview mirror. We are entering kind of a dead period of football. So I'm going to be bringing plenty more content, gearing up for what's going to be a great 2024 season. And we still have basketball season to enjoy for a few more months. So make sure you check out our website, thefloorslap.com, or check us out on Twitter slash X at the floor slap. My buddy Jordan, the other partner in the floor slap, he has tons of great content coming out every week covering Big Ten basketball. So make sure you check us out there. The Big Ten Blitz will be back in just a few more weeks covering spring football and the NFL draft in the upcoming 2024 season. So make sure you like and subscribe us or subscribe to us and we'll be back before you know it. Have a great week, everyone.